So the thing is, is like this has been kind of my heart. I was gonna like last week. I know I had a, like was really just getting excited about Second Peter. I was in that for like a solid two weeks, just over and over and over and constantly grabbing stuff. And um, I really felt like we were gonna talk about you know add to your faith, you know virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self control. And I was about hey, you know we talked about Romans six. You know you're, it's by faith we're walking in faith, and this is what faith produces. So I was like, yeah, this is a great place to go, Lord. Yeah, add to your faith, like walk by faith and and do these things and grow in this. And I'm you know, excited. And then I'm like, let the Lord say back up. <laughs> You know, so I'm like, okay, where am I backing up to? Uh, and so what I want to talk about is kind of just about surrender and pain. I want to talk about pain. I want to talk about hurt. I want to talk about suffering. I want to talk about those. Like, and not, you can, you can obviously broad scope this. I can't cover everything. So you can, you can take this to any situation and what you're going through. You're going through a hard time. You're going through a struggle. You're going through a dilemma or you're just having, you're like, man, I feel like I'm massively screwed up. I really want to talk about that. And like, how do you bring that to God? Because uh, in John chapter 21, in, in verse 15, I'm starting, backdrop uh, of what just happened. A few men were out fishing. One of them was Peter. Peter uh, finds out it's the Lord. He jumps in. He swims to shore. They got some fish. He's already there, got a fire started, and invites them over to have breakfast with him. And so they're eating, and here's where we're at. And it says, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Well, shepherd my sheep, he told him. And he asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you, you I like this, this little, little break in here, you know everything. <laughs> like, you already know what's inside me. You already know me. Uh, there's no use hiding it. And you know that I love you. And so he says, what? Feed my sheep. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. This he said to indicate what kind of death Peter would have to glorify God. And after saying this, he said, follow me. Hmm. I love how Jesus deals with this. Hmm. And I can understand you know, like what Peter does, he's grieved the third time. I feel like Peter's kind of caught on by the third time why he's asking him three times because three times he is denying Jesus. A lot. Three times it wasn't just anywhere. Last time he was by a fire. We talked about this. Where was he by a fire? He was by some strangers and he denied Jesus. Now he's sitting in the presence of Jesus and he is looking at Jesus straight in the eyes. And if you look again, I believe in Luke's account, you'll find out that after the third time that he denied Jesus, he lost locks eyes with Jesus as the rooster crows from across the courtyard. They're looking. And so the last time, I mean, I know it's the first time they've seen him since the resurrection, but you have all this familiarity coming back to Peter of this horrible, horrendous moment. I'm sure he wishes he could just put behind him, but just can't find a way. And what does Jesus do? He brings it out. And of course, if you know the Greek, uh, it says, John, do you, the first time he asked him, he says, for love, he uses agape, which is God's kind of love. It's an unconditional love. And Peter responds with the, the word phileo, which is a friendship type love. It's not unconditional. And then Jesus does it a second time, says, do you agape me? And he says, yes, Lord, I phileo you. And then the third time Jesus goes, do you phileo me? And he goes, yes, Lord, you know all things. I phileo you. See? Peter refused to acknowledge it. Before, you know, I like this, this proud Peter walking around. He doesn't he say it in Matthew chapter, chapter 26? If all were even, look at that, if all were made to stumble, he'd like, even if God were to make everybody stumble, we were made for that purpose. I will never do it. That's pretty arrogant. <laughs> this is Peter, and now he's just humble. He's like, I cannot claim I agape you. But here's Jesus trying to push him to that point, saying, but you're going to need to agape me. You're going to need unconditional love to do what I have called you to do, because he, didn't call, he commissions him. And he even reassures Peter, you're going to do it. 
You're going to die a death. You're going to have the opportunity again. It's going to be in front of you. The very thing that caused you to deny me, the point of you're going to have to lay your life down, you will either deny me and save your life or you will confess me and die. He goes, you will confess me. You will die. The thing you thought you would do, you will do. I promise it's coming, so start following. I love that he brings them there, but at the same time, you know what? It's Jesus that brings them here, and that's the question I have. I wrote these down uh, because... I, I was really kind of meditating on this, this kind of pain, this kind of thing, because I'm going, what do you do with such pain, remorse, and regret? If you're Peter, what do you do with that? And every Christian's going to say, well, you go to God, but how? Peter's right in the presence of Jesus, and he never asks the question. He never goes to him with it. He's too ashamed, probably. He denied him. He probably felt like he betrayed him. And I wrote that down too. So this is the first encounter they had with him at the resurrection. Yet this denial, this moment is seared in well into his own mind. And again, what do you do with such pain? What do you do when you remember looking into the eyes of Jesus in the midst of your own betrayal of him, of your own denial? Now you, when you look at him and you look into his eyes, all you do is relive that moment. Only God could save me from such a thing and save him from such a thing. Only God can take pain and make it into something beautiful, fully redeeming us in the situation in itself. And I understand that, but again, how do you do it? What do you do? If you're Peter, you're just stuck. And it's probably how he felt. He's just stuck. And then the third time comes around and he's grieved and he has every right to be grieved because it's still inside of him. He's still got to deal with it. And Jesus knows that. And that's why he's dealing with them. Because he already told them in Matthew earlier on, hey, on this rock, I will build my church. And I'm going to use you to do it. I'm going to give you some keys. You're going to have authority. You're, he comes out. And he's like, he's like uh, you're going to be an instrument for my kingdom. And that never changed anything. Like, so we got to fix this. Because right now, I'm sure Peter feels pretty broken. You can obviously see that there's still love and loyalty because when he hears it's Jesus, there's part of him that's just, yay, excited because it's Jesus. And so he jumps into the water. He's obviously got love. He's obviously excited. He's obviously got affection. He obviously wants to be loyal and follow. And all of us have that to wrestle with. You have that idea, I want to follow. But what about this? I did this. And it doesn't stop there. If you go to, I do want to go to Luke chapter 22. I cheated. I put a marker in this time, so I'm like, one shot. You know they didn't understand what was about to happen. And in Luke chapter 22, talks to them about, again, he says, when I sent you without money bag, traveling bag or sandals did you lack anything and they said not a thing and he said to them now but now whoever has a money bag should take it and also a traveling bag and whoever doesn't have a sword should sell his robe and buy one for i tell you what is written must be fulfilled in me and he was counted among the lawless yes that is written about me and it's coming to its fulfillment and they said lord look here are two swords and jesus that is enough he told them now i don't know what the no one really can tell you what that is enough means, whether he's like, you're not getting it. It probably does mean that. They just weren't getting it. Uh, or you just say, you know, don't worry about it. The thing is, is like they weren't getting it. It wasn't sure if like two is enough. They probably took it that way. But really, come on, what is two swords in the midst of an army? You got 12 of you and you two of you got swords. Yeah, we're doing great. You know, it's not, this isn't, this isn't really what he meant. We know that. But what Jesus is trying to say is, is why he's like, you know what? Time for travel, time to depend on me, time for me to go preach the gospel, heal and do these things is over. The nature of my mission has changed. Now it's time to die. Everything's about to change. Everything you thought you knew is going to be shaken and brought low. Everything you thought you were, every confidence you've ever had in yourself is going to be exposed. And when you thought it was, all it was, then you'll find out it was just masked. You thought it was confidence in me, but you'll find out for its real worth, it was confidence in yourself. And so he went out to, uh, and made his, as, his way, as usual, to the Mount of Olives. 
and the, which is also, you know, Gethsemane. And the disciples followed them. And when he reached the place, he told them, pray that you may not fall in temptation. Then he withdrew from there a stone's throw, knelt down, and began to pray, which just means just a short distance. He wasn't too far from them. And he prays, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. That's powerful. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. It's powerful because you see the realism of Jesus in this moment. He's always real, but you really get to the, the core of what's going on here. You find that if Jesus is praying such a prayer, this is, this is a moment to really be understood. And this is, listen to this, though, it says, when he prays this, nevertheless, not your will, but yours, not my will, but yours be done. In verse 43, it says, then an angel from heaven appeared to him in st strengthening him. That's pretty amazing. But being in anguish, he prayed more fervently. Notice what he does in his pain. Notice what he, he does when he is sorrowful. Most of us are just like, we're the disciples. And there's an understanding. I am not beating up on the disciples. If you, I'm going to jump down really quick. It says, and when he got, in verse 45, it says, he got up from prayer and came to disciples. He found them sleeping. Why were they sleeping? Well, it gives us reason. They were exhausted from their grief. You ever gone through some times of grief in your life? Lose somebody, something horrible happened. Grief is exhausting. How many know that? You lose a loved one, and you'll find out how exhausting it is. Talk to someone who's lost a loved one. Go in their house, sit and talk with them, and it'll probably come out of their mouth. I'm just tired, and I want this to be done. As a pastor, I can't tell many times I've heard that line. When I sit down and talk, hey, we got to talk about the funeral. We got to do this. How, but I said, before we do, how are you doing? I like to ask that question. How are you doing? I go, not about the loss, I said, but, but with the midst of everything going on right now, the chaos, the phone calls, the decision making, I want to ask, how are you doing? You know, just to hear it. And a lot of them will say, I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I haven't slept. I just, I just have to keep pushing, but I am just done. Grief will do that to a person. It weighs heavy. So I can understand it, but yet even so, I would say, as Jesus answers them, why are you sleeping? Even though I understand it, that doesn't mean it excuses it, right? I think a lot of times as Christians, we're like, well, you don't know what I'm going through. And it's like, it doesn't matter if I, I do. Even if I did, I don't think it would matter because you're not looking for understanding. You're looking for an excuse to stay where you're at. When we defend ourselves, let's be honest, that's what we're doing, right? Because isn't that what a defense does? Keep things where they're at. My, my Packers lost yesterday because they just didn't keep the San Francisco 49ers where they were at. <laughs> you know, they let the ball go forward. You know, the defense is the goal is to not let them go forward. That's what, when you're defensive, your goal is to stand your ground. You're not looking to advance. You're just like, I'm not moving. And so when we get does like, you know, I know they don't get defensive, but have you ever had those conversations? You're like, you try to tell them to move forward, and they're like, no. But they don't do it that way. They're like, well, here's why, and da, 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 and and then they'll sometimes they'll play the emotional card and they'll get teary-eyed and then they'll say you're not being sensitive and all this, but you're like, come on, guys. And I'm not saying you should be insensitive and that gives you the right. I think you should be sensitive. I think you should be trying to understand this situation. But I think on both sides, we can all, both admit, all of us admit, there are times where, you know, we were just making excuses. And so we got this going on, but I love it. In the midst of all of this, we got a Savior who was willing to go against it all, who was willing to lay it all down, who's willing to ignore the tiredness. He's got a big day ahead of him tomorrow. He's got to go through six trials in less than a day, less than 24 hours. He's going to go before Annas, Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, then to Pilate, over to Herod, back to Pilate. That's six. It's a long day. Then, I got to, then he's got to go walk. About a, I don't, it wasn't that far. Everyone thinks like this is massive trek out to the cross. It wasn't that far. It doesn't matter, though. I mean, you'd be beaten after the way he was and then carrying this thing up a hill in any kind of shape or form. You imagine carrying a cross up on just when you're in tip-top shape. It's exhausting. Imagine being what he did. But he's got to do all that, and he's like, you know what? I could use a, a couple extra hours of shut-eye. I'm going to go sleep. Isn't that what we do? We wake up, oh, we didn't sleep well. Oh, God, you need to help me. I'm just not going to do that well today because I didn't get to sleep. I didn't sleep good. I had some horrible dreams, and I don't know what's going on. I don't have a piece about me. And it's like, pray. 
Even if it's for five minutes, pray. Jesus shows us in the midst of it all, like, you know what? I'm finding that prayer is more valuable. Run to prayer. But I look at what Jesus is doing here. And he uses this, and I want to really tackle this. Not my will, but yours be done. How many of us have prayed that prayer? I'm not against it. I want you to understand that. But it is harder than we think. The thing is, is it sums up the Christian life, doesn't it, that prayer? I mean, in order to be a Christian, you have to surrender your will to take up the will of another. You're taking up the will of your, of your Savior, of your Lord. You're calling him Lord or King, then you have to do your Lord or your King's will, not your own. You do his. You live at, you live at your own, you live to go ahead and serve him. Whatever the expense, whatever the cost, that's why Jesus said, if you want to be my follower, you've got to count the cost. Because it costs things. And the road is difficult. The way is narrow when there are few who find it. And but before I get to that, I want to come back to Peter. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 31 through 35, you're, you're going to find the story where Jesus predicts. He predicts the denial of Peter. And that's the, that's the place where, where he does say, I will not stumble. But you know what? The, I love this idea that, that he predicts it. He didn't have to say this, but I love that he just says it. I love that he brings this out to Peter saying, you will deny me. He does the, how many know God, Jesus does things for a reason? He doesn't just, hey, look at the show off and showboat that I can prophesy and I know everything. He, these are words of comfort, whether you realize it or not. They sound like word, they are troubling words, but at the same time, they are words of comfort. You see, here's Peter, because well, we already, we're already fast-forwarding again. Here's Peter. He's sitting in, the, in this little courtyard. He denies three times the rooster crows. It says that he weeps bitterly here in Luke chapter 22, verse 62. He went outside and wept bitterly. Forever, I can guarantee you, for the rest of his life, he'd hear a rooster crow just about every time. I guarantee you what he thought of that moment. You're like, well, how do you escape that then? Who says that moment when he heard it every time brought him back to a place of sorrow, though? See, I truly don't believe that. I believe that eventually when, you know, when Jesus redeems you, he redeems your past. And so we got Peter obviously redeemed in the future in the book of Acts. We know it's already done. We already know that he does it in the book of John. That's what's going on. And, and Jesus brings it all together. Uh, so I decided to write this down as a note because I really think that it, play, it plays a wonderful promise to all of us. When you need to understand that when you're in the midst of something horrific and you can't go to God, you ever feel like you can't go to God? I mean, or am I the only one? I mean, you ever been there? You feel like you've done too much? You're just like, you're like, I would say like people like, no, I go, well, you're more holy than I am. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, I don't think you're smarter than I am on that one. I think that's foolish. I go, I think we've all been there where we feel like we've gone too far. I don't, I don't know if anyone who's ever said that. They're like, no, I've never felt that. I'm like, I'm pretty sure everyone has. It's written in here for a reason to remember. You can't go too far, but we need those reminders because our flesh constantly goes, I've gone too far. So I wrote this down. It's, Although this caused great pain, it would one day serve Peter well. This denial, this, this, this idea would serve him well. Why? Not because of it happening, but because of the words of Jesus. This moment not only humbled him out of trust and causing him not to trust in himself. I guarantee you it did that. You thought you could. You thought, and he was like, he struck a servant's ear. Off. I don't even know that. They asked the question, should we, should we draw the sword? Should we fight? And Peter don't even wait for an answer. He just, because it says, shall we? And I think that that's even in this, right? Yeah, it's right here in Luke. Listen to this. Verse 49, when they saw those around, when those around saw what was going to happen, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. It's like, he didn't even wait. He's like, that's not even a question. We're doing it. You know, he does it. And that person was Peter. Side note, I really find it interesting that the last miracle that Jesus does is to fix the mistake of his own disciple. You know, I think that God does that a lot today. 
cleans up our messes? How many people do you know have been, been wounded by church people? Wounded by religion and, and people taking this word and sword of the spirit, you know, and cutting people in such a hard way. If we could spiritually see it, it'd probably be a lot of right ears on the floor. The thing is, is Jesus, he goes, oh, he can heal that hurt. And I, I always pray that, that this, this place would be that, that not just here in this place. I pray when you go out that wherever you are, when people, when you hear those words, oh, I just had a bad experience, that I pray that you would have a heart and that God would give you wisdom to go ahead and be a, an avenue in which God can use to make that be different, that you could bring about an, a connection between them and God, that they would be able to be healed from that hurt. You wouldn't be the one to cause hurt. So you got Peter who's really gung-ho. He's trying to prove something. We don't know what, but he's trying to prove it. And it's really foolish because Jesus even says in another account, he goes, don't you know that I could call down 144,000 angels if I wanted in a single word? If Jesus wanted to, he could have went ahead in a matter of seconds all the way over to Caesar's palace and did every life. None of this is out of his control. None of it. He could do whatever he wants. We just say, said, what kind of self-control is this that you'd have angels available and you wouldn't use them? You'd just stay there on the cross. But one day this would serve him well, again, all of this, because he talked about his death often to the disciples. He talked about Peter's denial. He let him know it's going to happen. And not just that he did do it three times. He said, there will be a rooster that crows. I like that he uses a rooster. I'm not going to lie, I do, because I actually wrote that down. I said, this is kind of funny, but it's really cool. Because what I wrote was, this is going to serve him well one day because one day he's going to look, he would look back on this and it would speak volumes about just how much God really was in control. That he saw the moment of the denial and spoke it. And not only did he see the moment, he was in control of the rooster that crowed. He goes, it will crow when I want it to crow. And it will crow after you deny me the third time. He was in complete control. Control. God is like, I got this. And so Peter can look back on this and go, you got this, God. I look at my denial, but you saw my denial. I looked at that, and I couldn't believe they took you away, and we all ran, but you said we would, they would take you away, and we would all run. Like, you saw it coming. This was all your plan. This was all in your control. And I was like, Dale talked about it like it was past tense, like, but yet it was future. I was like, God, I, was like, I got this, guys. And he's got your life in his hands. And so you can imagine in the times that he would go about in his future, not only in hard times that maybe he would, uh, he would go through, but also during failure, he would say, God, you saw this too, and you got me. That precious blood of Jesus Christ has got me. That's why he gave it. So bringing this back to that, that idea We have Peter who carried out his own will. How do we go from carrying out our will to his will? To What is the cost of praying, not my will, but yours be done? You see, here we can look at it and, and we can go and say, God, I want your will to be done. Well, do you understand the cost of that? Because we have Jesus, we're like, well, you look at what Jesus, and if that's not enough, you're like, well, that's Jesus. Look at Jesus. I can't be Jesus. Like, he's perfect. And how can I be like, well, there are so, let's look. I want to look at one other example. And I think it lays out an extremely clear picture of what it would take for you and I to actually say, hey, with full conviction, like, you, I want you to understand. Like, I want you to understand when we walk away from it what this means, what it, what it means for you to say, not my will, but yours be done in your life, to actually not just say it, but lay it down. And I'm going to go to the book of Genesis for that. And I'm going to go to chapter 22. After these things, God tested Abraham and said, Abraham, Abraham answered, here I am. And so God said, take your son 
your only son, whom you love. And go to the land of Moriah and offer him there. So I just got a few things highlighted. I went ahead and I want you to hear the language. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him. I underline that. I go, boy, what does that sound like? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Not only that, but then you feel like, like, where's love? Matthew 3, 17, this is my son whom I love. God is playing a picture here. He's painting a beautiful picture. So Abraham gets up early in the morning, saddles a donkey, takes two young men, and his son Isaac splits, the off, uh, splits up the wood for the burnt offering and sets out to the place that it goes, that God told him to go. And it says it takes the, he gets there on the third day. You imagine three days having to deal with this thought. Three days, you got to walk. Three days, you are leading your own son to his death and you haven't even told him. Three days, I can't imagine that didn't affect you. Three days where you have to sit there and either smile at your son like nothing's wrong or your son's feeling like you're like, what's wrong, Father, and you just won't tell him. But three days, I mean, come on, that's not long, but let's face it, that first day, God says, go here. That's going to be crystal clear, but I think every one of us has had that in our lives where we feel like God spoke something to us. And it's just crystal clear, but then a little bit of time passes, Things start bombarding us. Hardship, pain, suffering. We're struggling. All of a sudden, we're like, well, was it really God? I don't know what Abraham suffered with in these three days, but I do know he suffered with one thing, having to offer up his son. I could only imagine he probably prayed, Father, please, or God, please, Please, God, just let it be me instead. Let me be the one on the altar. I don't know of a father on the planet that wouldn't pray that prayer for their kid. If that was just like, no, let it be me instead. Anything but that. Three days to deal with grief, sorrow, pain, and questions. See, the thing is, is I want to say that you notice that God doesn't tell him why. He never tells him why. The whole three days, you don't find that there was a conversation said. I don't know if Abraham prayed. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. He could have been had his, like, kind of like a Jesus, set his face like Flint and just said, I'm going to get there. I don't know. I'm sure he thought and talked in his mind. I, I know that's going to happen. That's what, we, that's what any man would do. But we do understand one thing is, is that this was a hard journey. You see, Abraham, he had to do something that required faith. This, is, this requires faith. You know, if you look back at his life, there's no doubt that he had faith. There's no doubt that he trusted. But there's also, there's also times where you do look, and he does put some, put some stock into himself, takes matters into his own hands. We can name one, right? Ishmael. He tries to birth his own Isaac. That's not the only time. One time he's in Egypt. They're walking around. He knows his wife's beautiful. So he says, you know what? Me and you, we're going to lie about who you are. You're my sister. And the Egyptians take him, take her. The, king, the Pharaoh finds her attractive, and he just lets her go. He doesn't go, wait a minute. No, no, no. He's like, no, I'm good. I'm going to preserve my own life. I'm trying to survive here. God will understand. I don't know. And But God graciously intervenes. Why does God graciously intervene? That was because it's gracious. I was like, Pharaoh didn't do anything wrong. He thought it was his sister. He goes like, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? I didn't do anything to you. Why would you do this to me? And he goes, well, <laughs> here's why. He's like, but we didn't do anything. God protects him. But here's the thing. Then Abraham walks out, and he is richer as he walks out, then he walked in, even in his own mistake. He walks in, makes a huge mistake, and he is blessed for it. 
Not because of the mistake, but because why? God is God, and he made a covenant with him. And he says, I will bless you. I'm protecting my covenant. I said I will make you a father of many nations, and I mean it. I will have your son. I will have that seed. It will happen. But you have Abraham at times, he would take matters into his own hands. But let's face it, I tried to think of it. I go, I don't think there's a way out of this. There's no way to protect yourself. There's no way to preserve life. You can't get out of this, Abraham. You can't birth an Ishmael. You can't go ahead and God already ruled that out. Your only son, and he named his only son Isaac. He goes, take your only son, Isaac, and offer him on the altar. He was very specific. God's like, there's no wiggle room. You can't protect yourself. You can't save yourself. You can't deliver yourself, and you can't get out of this. You will either do it or you won't. There, it is a straightforward test, and it is a hard test, and he does it. Don't get me wrong. He has faith. Hebrews says that he believed that God would raise him from the dead. He had no clue how God was going to do it, but he trusted God. Because you look at the conversation, and it says, Isaac spoke to his father in verse 7, saying, Father, my father, that had to hurt. <sighs> and he says, here I am, son. Here I am, my son. You're reassuring him, you're my son. I'm sure he's reassuring himself just as much, like this is him. God said, this is him. You get a little emotional on his part. He said, where's the lamb for the burnt offering, Father? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb. I don't think he had, I know Abraham had no clue how prophetic that statement was. I'm not even just talking about in that moment. I'm talking about how prophetic that was about Jesus. It's double prophetic. I don't think Abraham knew he was walking in that. He just literally said, God will provide the lamb. You're like, wait, why didn't Abraham just say, well, I've been meaning to talk to you about this. Now that we're here on the mountain, let's talk about it. He doesn't do that. He says, God will provide. What's he, trying, it's, it's, what's he saying to his son? God will make a way. God will take care of this. God has this. He is putting his faith and his trust in God. Are you beginning to see what it takes not my will, but yours be done. This ain't a my will, but yours be done. I put $20 in an offering plate. This is when you pray, not my will, but yours be done. It's a laying down of something beyond value. You have, this is a prayer of complete surrender when you pray it. And I want to ask, do you have that in mind? Is that your goal? Is it your heart's cry? Say, I want full surrender, God. I want to be fully surrendered. You can have what you want. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what dream, what desire, what, what thought, whatever possession, you can have it. As long as I get to do your will, I will do it no matter what. Is that really your heart's cry? Or is it, my God, I want your will, but I want yours to be done and not mine. But then through and through you go and holding on to what is yours, saying, I, um, we've all done it. Come on. You're like praying. You're like, God, I, I've done it. I'm like, I've been walking in here, God. I just want your will to be done. I just do. I go pray, Father, you would do it. And then all of a sudden, something inside me is like, but please don't ask this. <laughs> you know, like, you can feel it. You don't even say it. You're just like, ooh, yeah, there's this area. I don't know if I want to give that up yet. You ever been there? Yeah. Okay, I'm not the only one. Good. You know, but you're like, that's what I'm saying. Like, we have to be willing to lay those down. And those are the moments where you're like, when that rise up, you go, all right, Father. And I'm usually, it's funny, I'm usually about in that same spot. I just do this circle around this middle one, and I'm in that back row where, where Patrick and Gabe are. I'll come right through those chairs, and I'm about there when it happens. And I'm like, well, take the corner, bow at the altar here. Just go, God, this is in my heart. I'm struggling to give it up, but I want to. And I want to be able to pray, not my will, but yours be done, and actually mean it. And not just sound pretty when I say it. Jesus would be the lamb. So they arrived at the place that God told them about Abraham, built the altar and arranged the wood. He bound his son. It's like the son didn't have a choice. See, the idea, there's a lot of imagery in that. See, there really wasn't a choice for Jesus. 
the idea that God would send his own son, it's written, like you said, it was written from before the beginning of the time, but before the foundations of the earth were laid, he was slain. Jesus had to go. He was bound, and that says they led him away bound, captive, and they led him bound to Annas. He was taken captive. And he was going to be the one that was killed that day, whether he liked it or not. It was the will of God. And of course, we know, though, that Jesus goes willingly. I'm sure Isaac did too. I don't think Isaac was one to go kicking and screaming. It doesn't say he did. It doesn't say he didn't. But I really do believe that Isaac was like, all right, well, God got us this far. If it weren't for him, I wouldn't even be born. I've heard the stories. We're good. I'm terrified, but we're good. And he placed him on the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. You should not be sitting in the front row, buddy. <laughs> but the angel called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, he says, do not lay a hand on that boy. And when I read this this time, I was like, this is what came out of my mouth. And I said, God, why would you spare my sons but not your own? I say, thank you. I don't know if I could give mine. I'm sorry, but I said, I, I don't know if I can. You saw my sons. That's why I started praying. I said, you see my sons that valuable that you would spare my own sons, Lucas and Asher. That you would give yours for mine. And I say, thank you. Thank you for sparing my boys. There's beauty in this story. See, the thing is, is God never wanted the sacrifice of Isaac. He never wanted it. It was never his intention. He was never going to let Isaac die. Because it was never about the sacrifice. It's never been about the sacrifice that we can give. 1 Samuel 15, 22. Saul is approached by Samuel. And what does he say? Because he didn't listen. He says, because they're having this argument, I did do the Lord's command. Why is there the bleeding of sheep in my ear? Well, we save the best to offer to your God. And what does Samuel say? Does the Lord delight in sacrifices? No, he delights in obedience. <laughs> That's not enough, John 14, 15. If you love me, you will sacrifice. No, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Proverbs 21, 3, Psalm 51, 15 through 17, all say the same thing. Hosea, I delight in what? I say I want mercy, not sacrifice. But when you look at mercy, what's it saying? If you look at the word mercy, you bring it into the Hebrew, it means loyal love. Because I want your loyalty. I want your unconditional love. I don't want your sacrifice. I don't want your ritual. I want you. You see, the thing is, in the end, you look, God had the plan. I will give everything. But I want to ask the question, will you? Are you willing to lay it all down? Are you willing to take your, even in your, not just your dreams, but your pain, will you bring them to him? Because I believe that you need to, I think Christians, we got to do a better job at taking our pain to him and letting him bring it into something beautiful. Because there are many people, there are many believers today living on crutches, 
saying, giving reason for, their, for why they live a certain way. Well, it's just the way I was. It is what I grew up in. This is what happens. Like, why won't you just give your pain to the Lord and let him turn it into something beautiful? Rather than it binding you, it would set you free and cause a testimony to be so great it would cause freedom to resound to the people around you and that would, that would cause such a transformation in, in the lives around you. Why wouldn't you want that? But again, we're here, we're going back to it. He looks up, and what does it say? He says that he sees something caught in the thicket, a ram. And so Abraham took, and listen to this, Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in the place of his son. Even Abraham recognized what that thing was. If there's no alternate sacrifice, my son has to die. For the wage, even though it wasn't written, he understood that there was not one righteous man on that planet. He understood himself to not be right. Abraham wasn't walking around saying, I'm righteous and you're not. Abraham understood his own depravity outside of God. He understood that if there was no sacrifice, it's, we're all deserving. So he gives it in place of his son. And this is obviously foreshadowing one day to the day that Jesus would come and die, that he would be the replacement sacrifice. You go into Hebrews, it goes extensively into this idea. And I don't got time, but I love it. It says, the Lord will provide. Hallelujah, he was right. The prophecy came true. God will provide a way. He will make a way. And I want to say today, he will make a way through for you, whether it's through your pain, through your hardship, whatever you got to do. Maybe you're not going through something now, but I want to ask you, are you willing to surrender all? Are you willing to give it all? What's in your way? What's your Isaac that you actually have to lay down to pray that prayer, not my will, but yours be done? Because it's those times. I don't have to pray, not my will, but yours be done on a lot of little things. Because it's not that hard to do it. How many have things you're like, to do the Lord's will, sometimes you're like, that's not that hard, I'll do it. Jesus doesn't pray this every single time. He prays this in the most dire moment. And you read here, you're seeing Abraham lay his own will down to have his son by his side whom he loves, and he's willing to give it up. Why? To do the will of God. You know this ain't Abraham's will. So I want to ask you, what's the hard thing? What's the difficult thing? What's the valuable thing that you need to give up to, to surrender, to trust into God's hands rather than trying to be like a, a Abraham in Egypt or with Hagar, trying to make it happen on your own, do it your way and calling it and, and writing it by going ahead and writing your own story, closing the book and calling it God's will when it's anything but because you wrote it. Don't do that. The enemy is a great deceiver, and he will try to get you to do that, and he's very good at counterfeiting. Today, I, um, I do, we are going to just have this one response time song. And if you just want to sing along, the words will be on the screen. And uh, what I really just want you to do, though, in this time, whatever it looks like, whether that's come up here, um, I would say, go for it. I encourage people to. I can't tell you how many times I remember coming up as a teenager to the altar uh, during a Sunday service. I mean, almost, I was left there like, anytime the altar was open, like my, my pastor would be like, you know, like he told me that. And I didn't do it at first because I was like, I didn't really understand. I was like, whatever, you can do it in your chair. And it wasn't about whether I could or couldn't. It was, I, and people were like, did God ever call you up there? I go, I don't know. Yeah, I probably a couple times. Like, why do you, like, people are like, why do you go up there? Because I want to. I go, I read in the Bible the value of an altar, and I go, I don't know, there's something about moving forward. And I said, I'm one of those, I see things and I connect things better with action and movement rather than, I don't know, like if I just say something, like I'm one of those guys, like, oh, did I? If I, I make an action, I don't know, it was a movement of faith. Like, I had this connection, and I go, it worked for me. And some people need that, and if you're one of those, I just encourage you, just do it. But what I don't want you to do is just go and say, oh, I got this figured out and everything. I'm like, no, but reflect. Ask the Lord, hey, what is my, what is my Peter moment? Am I really going to go as far as I think I am? Peter thought he'd go the whole distance, and he ended up falling short, denying. And can I just say that is, that's all that's ever going to happen if you try to live by your own sacrifices. See, that's why God doesn't want your sacrifice. It's just not good enough. 
Isaac wasn't good enough of a sacrifice. The burnt offerings year after year weren't good enough. Hebrews explains that well. Otherwise, they would have stopped. But Jesus was good enough. He goes, I gave him the sacrifice. Now you live as a living sacrifice. You live for me. A living sacrifice doesn't mean you're giving. It means surrender. It said you have a surrender, a full-fledged lordship under Christ. And so I'm asking you, what is it you got to do? Is today you're like, today it's just I got to bring my pain. I got some things I'm going through. That's a great place to start. You know, I'm going through some difficult things. I felt like I was supposed to do the Lord's will in this, and, but I feel like I'm not doing it. I messed up. I feel like I'm probably, maybe I didn't deny Jesus, but you're like, I feel like I'm a Peter moment right now. I feel like I, I can't even look God in the eye without being reminded of the horrible thing I've done. Or maybe you're on the other end of pain where you're like in Abraham, God is pushing you and you haven't made a decision yet. You're like, I want to pray, not my will, but yours be done. But this is hard to lay down, and I really need to be strengthened by the Lord right now. Wherever you're at, I pray you would take it to the Lord. Because here's the thing, like, well, how do you do that? You talk to him. I know, it's just the thing is, like, Peter didn't have what we have today. We have a completed word to look upon and see our God for who he is. People ask that. Why did I've had been asked? Why did God ask Abraham to show who He is? From that point on, there was no doubt because so many pagan religions they would offer up their children as sacrifices, pat them pass through the fire. God shouts it out early on, really loud. I don't want your kids. I don't want your sacrifices. I want your obedience. I want your life. Follow me. I will bring the sacrifice. I will take care of the rest. I will bridge the gap because you can't. He makes it loud and clear. So will you bring your all? Will you give your all? Father, as we close this service, I pray that each person, each heart, each mind, each thought would be laid captive by you. Father, wherever somebody's at, if they're going through something right now and they have pain, I pray, Father, they would know that you're the God who can take pain and make it something glor- into something glorious. You can transform it. You did it with Peter, where he could probably even, he would look back and he would see it not as a moment of sorrow, but a moment, yes, of weakness, but one in which you saw and you redeemed him from, and it is a testimony of how in control you really are, how much you really do care about our lives. And Father, maybe there's those in this room that are in Abraham moment where they know there's something they're holding on to and it's valuable. It may not be a son or a daughter, but Father, maybe they're holding on to something and they know they're just treasuring it. And in order to move forward, they know they, I got to lay this down and trust that the Lord will provide a way when he wants to. I don't need to know why I need to lay this down. I don't need to know how it's going to happen. I just need to trust and have faith that God is who he says he is. For God, we believe that today. You are good. And I pray we would go and act in accordance to that belief. In the name of Jesus, I pray this. Amen.